Hey guys, Captain Henson here. So in today's video, I'll be talking about Kong Skull Island, both the movie and its novelization. So, yeah. Coming out in 2017, three years after Godzilla 2014, I remember when this movie was announced. Before Legendary had it, back when it was still under Universal, Man. To have been there when they announced that Legendary would be making the film and that it would be in the same universe as Godzilla 2014. And of course from there, oh, us fans knew what it, they were going to lead to. Though unlike, I wasn't as excited for this film as I was 2014. I love King Kong, don't get me wrong, but I mean, I just like Godzilla even more. Still though, not only getting a new King Kong film, it'd been like 12 years since Jackson's film, and also not only have it take place in the same universe as 2014 and pretty much confirming that we would be getting a Godzilla vs. Kong at some point, though having, though when exactly that would have been, so, yeah, I was really excited going into it, especially with the trailers, loving Kong's design in this movie. Honestly, I would have to say this is probably my favorite King or I mean, Kong design. He resembles an ape, but he isn't just a giant ape. Very much taking inspiration from the Toho um, design in that perspective, though there, you know, guy in suit, so had to stand on um, hind legs, and also the De Laurentiis film, also having a guy in a suit. Though again, the De Laurentiis design was very much just an a gorilla that just stood on its hind legs, and then the Toho films, well. Certainly didn't look, I mean, the design looked weird, but, yeah, I still liked it. But yeah, definitely my favorite Kong design here. He looks fantastic. And the also CGI here, like in Godzilla 2014, is really good. So, what are my thoughts on the film? So, I do like the fact that this put more of a focus on the titular monster. One of my main criticisms of 2014 that are that's still in effect even to this day is Godzilla isn't the main focus. Now I don't mean the stupid notion that he should have had more screen time. No. I mean in terms of the monster plot itself. The Mutos were the main monsters. They were the driving force of that plot. The things that pushed, that really pushed the plot forward. They were the focus. And while, yes, plenty of Godzilla films did that. Where Godzilla would play second fiddle to the new monster. But the thing is, those are sequels. We had already gotten, depending on the continuity, at least one film where Godzilla was alone. Where he was the focus. And I think introducing Godzilla to new audiences... Of course, the issue is how you portray Godzilla. They wanted to portray him as more of a heroic figure. Not superhero, but more heroic. Clearly, we're supposed to root for him against an evil monster. But here, though, Kong is the focus. We do have other monsters, the Skull Crawlers. But Kong is the monster who really sets the plot into motion, who sets up character arcs. 
and now all the skull crawlers also do that. Kong is the focus here. So already, that's something that I think this film has over 2014. And in terms of the human characters, now it, it should be noted that 2014 was a very character-driven story. We had a main character who pushed the plot forward. He was our focal point. But in here, though, it's an ensemble. I would have to compare it to, say, something like Rogue One. Where, yes, you can argue... Where, yes, you can argue that we do have a main character. But it's very much... Focusing on a, on this group. So, character development isn't as... Um, prevalent and... I would just go with prevalent as, say, with something like... 2014, but very much like with Rogue One, the stuff we do get with the characters is really good. We may not know ev we may not know a ton about them, and we may and we may have to share the focus among several characters. But we know enough about these characters to care about them, sympathize with them, and want to see, you know, where they go about in the story. We don't need these highly complex three-dimensional characters in order to have a good story or even have good, compelling characters. The characters here are fun to watch, definitely fun to watch, and we want to see where they go as the plot continues. And Skull Island in this movie is... I don't want to, it's, it's definitely not my favorite portrayal of Skull Island. I really like the Skull Island in this movie, not my favorite. If I had to, I'd probably have to say the Jackson version is my favorite. Just because it just, <sighs> it's difficult to say really because I like the Jackson version, and especially if you look at the World of Kong um, concept art book that really just expands it. I like the more dangerous, jungle-filled take on Skull Island. We do have jungles here, but they aren't as um, claustrophobic. There's a lot of open fields in this one. But again, I really like this take on Skull Island, and... Having more unique creatures here is also a plus. Because, for the most part, Skull Island can either be comprised of dinosaurs, just a giant snake, lazy bastards, or in the case of the Jackson version, evolved dinosaurs, but you know, still dinosaurs. But here, though, we get new we get new creatures, creatures that really make this feel like its own world, not just a lost world, but its own world. And going off of that, really like this take on Kong. Now, not only do I think his design is really good, but also his character. We get to see him be a character here. And for those who watched my collection video, know that I like Kai or my fan passion episode. Is that I like it when we get when the monsters have personality. And that could mean either like a little bit of anthropomorphization, anthropomorphization, whatever. Or even a lot. One of the reasons why I like the Showa era so much. And in here, we do get to see him, you know, be angry, be um, worried, sad, hurt, physically, I mean. He has a range of emotions, which is really nice to see. And the skull crawlers are also 
really cool. Terrifying looking motherfuckers, if I had to say. They do make really good enemies for Kong to fight in this movie. Very much the polar opposite of him. And... And that after credit scene... Of course, I already knew about it before watching it in the theater, unfortunately. Even if I didn't know, right before it, when we get all the copyrighted, um, or when we get the list of copyrights, we see copyright listings for Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and King Ghidorah, so... That sucks, but still. I may have known about it, but... <laughs> oh, God. A cinematic universe where I could, like, actually be excited for the next movie. And not only that, build up hype for the next movie. It would actually take more than a few months to get there. Granted, King of the Monsters had to be pushed back a fucking year, but that... So overall, Kong Skull Island is a really fun movie. It's a movie that you can easily just pop in and have fun. And not in the bad sort of fun. I mean, in the this is well made, had a lot of effort put into it. It has a well constructed story, characters, and it's just a fun ride. So... From there, the novelization. Now, going back to my thoughts on the 2014 novelization, where it doesn't change the movie, but it does add night, it does add character moments and interactions that I think improve helps strengthen that plot since like I said it is a very character driven story so having those moments there especially moments that we didn't see or weren't really developed in the movie is you know really good it helps the story Kong Skull Island The Skull Island novelization does act like an extended cut to the movie, similar to 2014, but we do have changes here, so making it very, so making it feel more like, you know, a novelization in that it uses, you know, earlier, it uses an earlier script as the basis, you know, such as... When ah fuck it, such as when Cole sacrifices himself. Now in the movie, his sacrifice is in vain. The skull crawler just whacks him, or as it as it's called in the novelization, the skull devil. The skull devil just knocks him with its tail, and he you know, hits the side of a cliff and blows up. But in the novelization, we it, it is still tragic. He does the skull crawler is about to bite him or eat him, but he blows up prematurely because the skull crawler was a bit too far away to reach him in time. But the other um, grenade hadn't gone off yet, so when he's blown up and you know chunks of his body fly over the place. The Skull Devil eats the grenade, and then it you know blows up. So definitely not as tragic as how the film portrayed it. I can take either or, but I gotta say, I mean, how it's portrayed in the film is just hurts, and in a good way too. Like, it sucks. And then also, Weaver 
when she's shooting the flares. She does hit the skull devil, but not in the side of the face that, you know, blows up. There are a few other things, too. Nothing that, like, oh, yeah. And another important change is before Chapman is eaten by the skull crawler, he's on the walkie with, with Packard. So Packard knows that Chapman is dead before, you know, um, Conrad, you know, shows the dog tags. And it doesn't change, it doesn't really change. Well, okay, that's not true. It further emphasizes the fact that Packard didn't really care about finding Chapman. I mean, he cared to a point, but he mostly cared about, you know, getting those weapons to fight Kong. And he didn't want to tell his men about Packard's death so they wouldn't, you know, lose faith. You know, to keep them um, fixated on the mission. So yeah, it just makes him even more unlikable here. And in terms of additional stuff... In terms of adding to the characters, oh yeah. We get this whole thing with Conrad about a mission he was with when he was SAS. Air British Special Force. When he was SAS. That led to the death of a little girl. Which haunts him. And with Weaver, we find out more about her Okay, not a lot about her childhood, but we learn about her relationship with her father. And how he had this perfectionist mindset toward her. You know, everything had to be perfect when, you know, she was doing anything. So, in that perspective, it does... It does add a lot. And also we get more character... Inter and we get more stuff on the... Athena, like having Con, like us seeing Conrad, you know, formally introduced to Packard, among other things, getting Conrad and Reaver, Weaver spending more time together, and also getting a ref and being told that one of the ships that went down at Skull Island was in nineteen thirty. Uh, a film crew back in 1933. So that was nice. Really nice to have there. And we also get to see Conrad fight a giant snake. That was cool, getting to see more of the creatures of Skull Island. And we also learn how exactly Gunpei died from the Skull Crawlers. And that, um, and that Marlowe saw it. And we actually get to see Gunpei talk here. It's a flashback, but it, again, nice additions. So in that regard, I would say Skull Island works really, really well as a um, companion piece to the movie. Because, like I said, given that it is an ensemble, the spotlight is shared amongst the group and not really fixated on one character. So it's nice to see more... So it's nice to see at least a few of them expanded a bit more. Well, the major characters in this. So what... I do recommend it. There are changes to the, or there are differences, like differences that don't alter the, don't alter the story too much, but they do change how you look at the story. Now, when it comes to these novelizations of the monster verse, I would say. 
If it doesn't contradict the movie, it's canon. Again, novelizations when it comes to these multimedia franchises can be really fucking tricky if they don't say anything. I mean, certainly the nice thing about Star Wars is that they say it. They specify what we do with novelizations. The MonsterVerse, it's really hard to say. But... I think the best way to look at it is, like I said, if it doesn't... If the information doesn't contradict the film, it's canon. And I think we can allow that when it comes to these novelizations, because novelizations, for the most part, use earlier versions of the script. So obviously you're going to expect some changes. But given that this is a cinematic universe and they are, you know, utilizing the external material, I think it's fair to say that, you know, non-contradictory information is canon. So yes, if you love Skull Island, I recommend the novelization. And if you're a fan of King Kong, fan of the MonsterVerse, fan of monster movies in general, I also highly recommend King Kong. Or Kong Skull Island. It's fun, well made, and really hypes you up for not only King of the Monsters, given the end credit scene, but also with the rematch that we've been waiting for since the early 60s. A crossover that I want to add wasn't confirmed until some time after this movie was released. So, what did you all think? Did you like Skull Island? Did you think the novelization did a lot to add to the story? Let me know in the comments section below. Until next time, this is Captain Henson, signing off.